Hello, and thanks for joining today's presentation. Um, this is Scott Dill with Real Story Group on the business development team. And uh, today, our, our founder, Tony Byrne, is going to walk you through some Pilates for your MarTech stack. It's something that uh, we're really excited about to, to take you through this particular presentation as we've been doing uh, a whole lot of com conversations with our uh, subscribers about their MarTech and Omnichannel technology stacks. And, um, you know, it'd be great to share those lessons with you today. So thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us. Uh, I see some folks from uh, all around the world here on, on the line. So uh, it's great to have you for a half hour today. Um, I do want to mention as we get started that we're happy to take uh, questions or, or feedback. And if you have that, uh, please enter that into the questions tab here in the Go to webinar control panel. Um, also, for the uh, subscribers on the line, you'll be able to uh, download a, a copy uh, of this or a recording of this presentation within the next couple of days from your subscriber library. And we'll be sending out uh, the slide deck to all of today's attendees. So keep an eye out for that uh, over the next couple of days. With that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Tony. And uh, Tony, just take it away. Great. Thanks, Scott. Really excited to be here talking about a subject that seems um, increasingly germane uh, to MarTech leaders and, uh, and stack leaders. So, um, so first, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about Real Story Group. Where do we come from? Why are we talking about this? I founded the firm in 2001, really in reaction to this quadrant that you see on the left, um, which is obviously making fun at Forrester Waves and Gartner Quadrants, which uh, I was working at a systems integration company. We were implementing some solutions that nominally were in the top right-hand quadrant, and they weren't working out so well. So then I found out how that sausage was actually made and decided that there should be a different way of providing more independent analysis, uh, less in horse race mode, and more around helping you, the technology buyer, find the right fit. So I founded originally CMS Watch, now Real Story Group, and right away we made some really important decisions around how we were going to be truly independent, which was not to consult with vendors, not to speak at their events, not to advise them, not to write white papers. And that allowed us to create uh, what we believe is the, the most hard hitting vendor evaluations that you can find in the marketplace. And when we're advising you, the enterprise technology buyer, we're really sitting completely on your side of the table. We're not like some kind of a neutral broker. We're really just working uh, completely as a, as an enterprise technology customer advocate. And so over time, we started covering a lot of different technologies, ultimately put them all together, all the different marketplaces that we cover, and uh, put them all in a single visual uh, starting about 11 years ago, which we now call the omni-channel technology stack vendor model. So this covers you know, vendors and their products across a number of different marketplaces. each subway line here, or uh, is, a, is a marketplace and each tube stop is a particular vendor. Um, as you can see, there's kind of a city center with a number of well-known vendors um, that purport to do a lot of different things, although sometimes uh, not necessarily very well or very well integrated. And then you have out in the periphery a whole set of more uh, best of breed or single point solutions. Um, and that's obviously where a lot of the innovation is happening. But the bottom line is you as a customer across these different marketplaces, you have a lot of choices. And, you know, we believe that that, that choice is good. So uh, our mission in life is to help you interpret these marketplaces and make really good choices. Um, so this is one way of visualizing things. I think the kind of deeper story here is what does this look like for you in terms of your, you know, particular stack? So that's what we're talking about today. And I wanted to show a kind of a reference model that you know we, we've been using for almost a decade now. It's a kind of a traditional digital marketing and engagement reference model. It's the enterprise view of itself, um, sort of starting at the top with you've got major channels, um, and then you've got production interaction delivery services underneath that, um, including potentially communities, mobile middleware, e-commerce. Um, CDNs and online video platforms and so forth. And then there's this interesting area underneath, the kind of multicolored area for content and engagement management. And we've been working, you know, really hard, I think, over the last decade 
to all of us to sort of modernize that layer and really improve that layer. And ideally it lives on top of some sort of customer data backbone. That has been much more easier said than done. And, and there's an area of a lot of frustration. We'll have more to talk about there, but you know, there has been, I think a very healthy orientation towards the primacy of content in these sorts of engagement. And then finally, what is customer experience and how can we create more customer centric experiences? And that has led us to invest in digital asset management platforms, certainly web content and experience management, uh, email marketing and marketing automation, and, and obviously social engagement. And so there's been a lot of healthy investments in this area that we've seen. And we've been, pr been proud to be part of that decision making on your behalf. Um, but you know, let's, let's also acknowledge kind of what's really happening here as we expand these investments is that this sort of modernization that we're doing is, I would compare it to you know, if you're working out, you're kind of building, we're building some upper body strength, right? We're working on the parts of your stack that your customers actually see, right? That the, these customer touch points. So, so that's good. I mean, you know, we're working on our biceps and our, and our pecs. So, you know, we're implementing an enterprise dam to do more media-based storytelling. Great. Uh, if you haven't done that, you definitely want to think about that. Um, implementing website personalization. Good. You know, we're, we want to drive more relevant experiences for our prospects and customers. Consolidating and updating our CRM platforms, very important, very overdue in many organizations. Really trying to get a handle on this, get to more modern cloud-based solutions um, and, and putting a lot of energy into that. Obviously testing and segmenting our outbound messages, whether that's email, direct mail, ads, whatever, the way that we're kind of reaching out to people to get them to put their hand up and, and engage with us, doing a lot more testing, a lot more segmentation, a lot of more fine-grained analysis there, um, and, and improving our spend and, and being more efficient about the way we do that. And then having more kind of channel-specific, deriving channel-specific messages across social media rather than treating it all as kind of one big blob, being, having very specific ways of engaging on Twitter versus Instagram versus Facebook versus LinkedIn, so on and so forth. And so, you know, a lot of you are still undertaking this work and, and at some level it may feel like it's never done and that, that may well be true. The problem with this is that, again, while this is all useful, we're really just kind of working on on our on our upper body here. And and so what's happened is we've created all of these kind of really sophisticated silos within our stack. And this is creating a number of problems for us. Uh, if we start in the lower left here, at the bottom, what's happening is that data is getting stuck. Um, it's inconsistent and not actionable across channels. I've got data about people in my web environment, separate data in my email environment, separate data in social, separate data in my CRM, and even worse, content and experience and rules become platform specific rather than enterprise wide. So the way that I'm talking to an individual in the CRM or call center may be very different than the way that I'm talking to them um, when I'm emailing them, which may be very different than the way that we're engaging with them on our website and our web applications. And this is then decision logic also gets trapped within individual delivery channels. We may be doing personalization one way on our website, but a very different way in our marketing automation environment. And so what happens is two things. First, customers and prospects don't enjoy integrated consistent experiences. They, they experience maybe more modern and sophisticated engagement with us within a particular channel, but not across channels. And we as the enterprise don't always have a really coherent, sophisticated 360 degree, degree view and strategy and engagement model that's not channel specific. And so you can probably recognize many of the symptoms that you see on the right, certainly afflicting most of the subscribers that we work with. Um, and so the question then becomes, okay, we know how we got here, but what do we do next? So again, I'm going to disagree with Gartner and Forrester, and their advice is basically to tell you to double down on the 2010s um, with this notion that there's such a thing as a digital experience platform, this idea that a single vendor can provide all these sorts of capabilities for you, and then you'll have this kind of cross-channel stack. Um, I think this is a complete BS. There's no single vendor that's going to get you an omni-channel stack. No single technology is going to get you an omni-channel stack. Digital experience platforms don't actually exist in the real world. This is just vendor marketing speak being uh, projected out through uh, by traditional analyst firms the way that they typically do. 
what you need to do is for the 2020s as you build your stack for the next decade to really take control of it and make it more omnichannel. And the way you do this, we believe, is to introduce kind of a new layer in this stack. So yes, at the top, you still have engagement channels. You still have in the gray interaction delivery services under, you know, underpinning some of those channels. Yes, you still have content and engagement management services, WCM, email, social engagement, CRM, service and support. Those remain important. But the part I want to point you to here is these enterprise foundation services. These are things that you do, key services that you move lower in your stack so they're not bound to a particular channel. So you've got journey orchestration and decisioning, customer data, platforms, omni-channel content platform, and then operations hubs. I'm going to talk about those in a second. Obviously, intelligence hubs become really important here so that you can have cross-channel analytics, reporting and visualization, predictive modeling, and obviously customer and identity access management has always been important, becomes increasingly important in this omni-channel world. So rather than going the DXP route, instead, can try to convert your MarTech stack into more of an omni-channel technology stack. And the way you do that is through enterprise foundation services. So this is a way of kind of summarizing what this means in terms of moving key services lower in your stack is that content and engagement management services in the middle here become more like order takers and your enterprise foundation services become more like decision makers. Now, to be sure, there's certain things that are channel specific that you need to do that remain important. So, for example, at the actual customer facing tier, you need contextualization, assembly of experiences, delivery of those experiences, interaction. So these things do remain important. But what you want to do is start thinking more enterprise wide around uh, concepts like core data, our core customer data, our core content that we want to reuse across channels, our insights and orchestration of these experiences, including personalization that's not channel specific. And obviously then you need to be thinking about omni-channel collaboration and enterprise accessibility of all these services. So the way to put this is, in a sense, Pilates for your stack, like work on your core, not just your upper body, but work on your core so that you can support this and have a more healthy, holistic stack that can work across your environments and your channels. There's really four key business services we believe that um, are going to become increasingly important in the next decade as the for, to underpin uh, your core. Um, first, our operations hubs would allow you to collaborate, create, and schedule internally and, and externally. So these are internal tools that you use and possibly share with partners and suppliers. Then journey orchestration and decisioning, which is where you're listening, mapping, and executing and optimizing omni-channel journeys rather than having personalization and segmentation and rules within a specific channel. Customer data platforms, whether you build one or you buy one, this is where you have your definitive customer data and segments so that you have a unified customer and prospect records that are readily available to all your frontline CX systems. And then omni-channel content platform, we, um, this is a really interesting emerging market. Uh, we kind of invented this phrase omni-channel content platform because it was sort of a market looking for a label. And this is where you have reuse focused content, sort of one-stop content that can be used across uh, all of your different channels. So let's take a look at these briefly. Uh, Real Story Group is now evaluating these vendors. So if you're looking out to uh, select vendors in these segments, definitely come check out our research. Um, but we'll start with the CDPs. Many of you are going to be familiar with customer data platforms. They take first party, second and third party data, unify it with some identity resolution, provide some other services potentially like data cleaning, device stitching, relationship graphing, certainly segmentation really important, and then allows you across channels to then activate against that data to provide the right messaging and experiences whether it's through ads, social, websites, CRM, so on and so forth. And increasingly now some lightweight analytics as well, which is really interesting. We call this accessible analytics. And so this is what customer data platforms do um, because it's so self-evidently useful. A number of different vendors have popped up to say that they actually do this. You have like many MarTech marketplaces, um, suite vendors, who are active in this space, although they're, I would argue they're a little bit late to the game. And then of course, a wide variety of pure play vendors as well. 
So the sweet vendors, again, tend to be somewhat parochial, incomplete, um, not always good at persisting the data. The pure play vendors, although they've, we've seen nearly a billion dollars of venture funding across this space, they still tend to be small, independent, potentially not as mature, although we're seeing some really interesting specialization, including vertical specialization. So um, you have a lot of choices here. Um, it's been really interesting for us to watch this marketplace grow. We um, have our, apply our usual methodologies for how do you then evaluate these vendors if you have so many different choices. And the way that you do that, of course, is through use cases. This is the way that Real Store Group evaluates all the different technologies that we cover. There's at least nine different business use cases for a CDP. I won't go into all of these. You can see some recorded webinars around CDPs from our webinar library. Um, but these are actual, these aren't feature-based evaluations. These are business use case-based. So these are business use cases for CDPs. And what's interesting is that the typical vendor, not surprisingly, is usually only excels at three or four of these and maybe supports two or three others. So it's really important for you to prioritize, hey, what are the use cases that are really important for our enterprise? And then match up against the right vendor that way. Very similar story in the journey orchestration engine technology landscape, suite vendors, um, some coming out of the kind of BPM space, some out of the MarTech space, and then some really interesting pure play vendors again. Um, once more, uh, you want to look at this from a use case perspective. I mean, nominally, journey orchestration engines all do the similar things. They take data and events, and then they start watching and listening and then help you map against particular journeys and then execute on those journeys and then potentially analyze and optimize what's happening across different channels. So functionally, there's a lot of similarity. Again, the way that the vendors differ is what among these six use cases do they really excel at? And, and typically, a, a, a single journey orchestration vendor is going to excel at maybe two or three of these, in some cases, simply not support some of the other ones. And so, once again, really important for you to understand what are our key priorities here as we look at this kind of really increasingly important layer in, in our core. So a good example of what's happening here is, you know, what Oracle and, and for that matter, Adobe and, and Salesforce are doing, which is sort of taking their existing kind of email and messaging oriented platforms and telling you that they're omni-channel. And I'm here to tell you that they're largely not omni-channel. They're very focused on outbound communications, but there's a lot of really critical use cases for journey orchestration that are not outbound oriented, um, that revolve more around support and services and certainly website personalization. So. This, again, is an area where you need to be skeptical about some of the incumbent vendors in this space. And the third category we'll look at in your core is omni-channel content platform. Really fascinating space. Um, it's really a, a kind of a content object store for um, often decomposed component-based content and assets emerging from uh, kind of a hybrid of the parts of the DAM marketplace and the headless WCM marketplace. Still an emerging technology, unclear exactly how it's going to play out. Our valuations, these vendors are due out in a couple of weeks. We'll have more to tell you about that then. Um, but a lot of really interesting use cases here for an enterprise to say, hey, I, I want to liberate some of my core content from individual channels so that I can use it and track it and derive it across channels. Um, and I, I think this is potentially revolutionary advent in your stack and something that certainly a lot of our subscribers are now looking at very closely now. And the fourth category is omni-channel operations hubs. Um, many of these technologies go back a decade or more. Um, they come out of various spaces, marketing and resource management, certainly campaign management, creative operations management, and content operations management. And so, these, what's happened is that, although these are neat boxes that analysts like us <laughs> like to create, the reality is that in the marketplace, there's a lot of overlaps. And so you've got a vendor that historically might have been a marketing resource management or marketing operations management vendor who's now saying that they can do campaign management or creative operations management vendor um, and now saying that they can also do content marketing and content operations and campaign management. And so... You do want to look at this space very carefully, particularly if you're trying to align um, experiences and campaigns and other things across channels. Um, you're going to need tools to help you do that internally, but you also don't want to overbuy here. Ideally, kind of, you know, high, really figuring out which two of these segments might be most important for you 
and which two might be more subsidiary, and then looking at the vendors and kind of matching up that way. Okay, so that was a pretty kind of brief tour of this space. Once again, I'll um, invite you, if you've got any questions at all, to put those in your go to webinar control panel. Um, and uh, we'll definitely get to those at the end here. But I wanted to just sort of wrap up on what you should be doing here. And so if you care about omni-channel customer experience, then you really need to start thinking enterprise and not department and not silo, right? And, and saying, if I really want to deliver a coherent omni-channel experience, I can't just personalize at my, at my uh, at, at my web tier. I can't just have my social engagement be a silo that's out there. Um, and so you're going to want to be thinking about investing in capabilities that are part of your core, essentially doing Pilates for your stack. So I've mentioned four categories, four segments here, operations hubs, journey orchestration, content platform, customer data platform. You can sense that we're enthusiastic about the technology, but because we're a real store group, we're always, always, always going to be skeptical about the vendors themselves and you should as well not just because these are new spaces because even some of the longer standing vendors here um, have holes in their capabilities have issues and challenges that you'll definitely want to address and so uh, I would just you know encourage you to do your due diligence obviously this is what we live and breathe to do. So if there's any way that our research can help you get a leg up on your choices, please let us know. But the bottom line here is that you want to invest in your core. And I think there's an opportunity to simplify in your upper body. That is across CRM, social, email, WCM, and DAM. In the future, we think that even large enterprises are going to be able to get away with having lighter solutions at that tier which is really interesting. And it's the opposite of what we've been doing for the last decade is that we've been kind of beefing up at that tier. But if you think about it, if we're moving our content and our data and our decision logic and our expertise and our collaboration lower in the stack, then the good news is going forward, we can get by with simpler solutions if they're just order takers at the content and engagement management tier. So that's really one of the good news stories, I think, um, out of this new stack for the 2020s. Just remember, platforms and vendors themselves are not omnichannel. They might talk about omnichannel, they might Adobe and Salesforce and uh, uh, the follow on to IBM now called Acoustic and Oracle and others may tell you that they can deliver omnichannel capabilities, but the reality is that their platforms tend to still be very highly siloed. Um, and so it's really gonna be up to you to build your omnichannel stack. Um, but the good news is that you can do it and you can do it piece by piece. And if there's any way that Real Story Group can help you get there, you know, please feel free to reach out. But the bottom line is like, don't be this guy. Don't go with uh, a Salesforce engagement model mo module just because you already have them for CRM. Really look at what are the unique scenarios you're trying to execute on the business side and then find the right fitting software. It may well be something from Salesforce, but it might be something from another vendor itself. So don't fall in love with the vendor, fall in love with the capabilities that you need, that your team needs, and then go forward and procure those. So again, if there's any way that, that we can help you, please let us know. Um, this is our uh, uh, persona of Stacy, the stack owner. She manages a MarTech soon omni-channel stack and really, um, really works hard uh, to answer a lot of questions. She's under a lot of pressure, a lot of new tools coming into her world. And what we live to do is to help Stacy make good, solid decisions so she can think about other things like what she's going to have for lunch uh, that day. So if, if this Stacy reminds me of, reminds you of what you have to do every day, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our mission in life is to make your life easier. So that was a pretty rapid fire tour, but hopefully you get the main points here around investing in your stack and so where to invest in your stack. So now we'll welcome some questions. Um, but as we go through those, Scott, if you want to just chime in on possible next steps here. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. A um, couple of things to keep in mind. You're welcome to download excerpt from our research at any time. You can do so. Uh, on our website under the research tab. Um, we also have a couple of other webinars 
on the schedule for this month. Next week, we'll be focusing on uh, dam technology and the right way to select dam. When the following week, we'll have the same uh, general theme, but in that case, we'll be looking at web content management technology. So hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, we do have a number of uh, briefings that can be downloaded, some uh, recorded briefings over the past uh, couple of months, and maybe a particular interest to take a look at the new uh, omni-channel stack, as well as the trends we're seeing uh, with our 2019 version of the omni-channel vendor map that Tony showed earlier in today's presentation. Um, we also invite you to try out uh, the tools on our site, such as the Real Quadrant Shortlist Builder and uh, the Real-Time Vendor Comparison Tool. And if you want to see a behind-the-scenes tour of what you would have access to as a subscriber, um, we certainly invite you to reach out to us at the email address on the page, and that's happy. Uh, we'd be happy to schedule that with you. With that, it does look like there are uh, a couple questions in the queue for you, Tony. Yeah. So the first one's from William, and he's got a really interesting question that I think is underneath this and sort of unspoken in all of this, which is, have you seen marketing processes become what's needed to support this new stack of the of the 2020s? Do you offer guidance in making sure marketers, agencies they work with, and the technologies vendors work together to achieve goals? So William, that's a really great question because obviously what's implied here, although we didn't make it explicit, is kind of a different operating model as well, right? That you have an omni-channel operating model as opposed to uh, a, a more kind of marketing specific that could be more campaign oriented. Instead, we have to figure out ways for um, for uh, you know support, service, web, digital, marketing, social, to be all kind of moving in the same direction. And uh, that's obviously a channel and a challenge. We're working right now with two dozen of our largest enterprise subscribers. These are all global 2000 firms. We're actually meeting up with their stack owners next week. And we're gonna be working on some operational models uh, and some governance models. So hopefully um, as soon as later this year, you'll hear from us on some of that, William, around what are some ways that we're not just changing our stack and getting stronger, lower in the stack technically, but getting longer, getting stronger, lower in the enterprise operationally as well. Um, so that's a whole another webinar sometime, I think. Um, as an analyst firm, our goal here would be to come up with some reference models around that. So hopefully we'll have something for you to share. David is asking, wondered if you guys could weigh in on ad tech and its position within your diagrams. We're increasingly seeing the lines getting blurred and the technical requirements are interesting. Wonder if you have a POV you can share. Yeah, David, it's a great question. Um, ad tech is obviously a really important piece of what we describe sort of more broadly as the broader kind of outbound technology um, uh, uh, you know, paradigm here where we're trying to reach out and um, and 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 touch people and, and and get them to engage, whether it's through advertising, email, social, what have you. And um, the ad world changing very rapidly now, uh, both because of new technologies, but also um, obviously what's happening in terms of privacy and compliance. And our our fundamental belief is that whatever your the level and degree of your investment in ad tech, this same model still applies because it's just one other channel, right? And and ideally, what you're doing on the ad side would be in sync with what you're doing in every other way that you're reaching out and engaging with individuals. And so to that extent, you know, rather than just using a DMP or data management platform, which typically then tied into your ad platform, you really want to be relying on a more comprehensive CDP or customer data platform that all of your different engagement channels, including your ad channel, can all speak to the same core reference of data. Similarly, in terms of orchestration, similarly, in terms of operational cohesion, similarly, in terms of having a core set of omni-channel content that's going to be consistent across all these streams. And so this is, you know, the ad silo has been a big, tough, strong silo, you know, with its own technologies, similar to CRM and sales in that way. And we're going to have to sort of break down some of those walls, um, not just technically, but also operationally. So with that, we've reached the bottom of the half hour. Wanted to thank you again for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Um, so for Scott Dill, this is Tony Byrne from Real Story Group, wishing you a great rest of your week and look forward to catching up with you again. Thanks again. Bye now.